Joining us now is a, a huge name, obviously, in the space. I'm personally very excited to have him on, uh, given everything that's going on. So please welcome now uh, Mark Yusko, founder, uh, CEO, and CIO of Morgan Creek Capital Management. Mark, uh, good to see you. Good to see you, Daniel. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And uh, I'm joined by uh, my uh, co host Darcy. Um, we're uh, both very excited to speak with you. Um, Mark, I guess my, my opening question is, you know, just set the stage for us here. Let me know where your, your mind is at, where your head is at. Obviously, Morgan Creek uh, been in the headlines uh, with this FTS fiasco. Just give us your take on things right now, Mark. Ooh, um, not, not sure I, I want to go completely it into to my take on, uh, on, on the FTX thing because, you know, the black hats may show up at the door. But um, look, the fact that Sam is, is going to speak today <laughs> at, at a conference rather than being behind bars is, is I don't even know what to call it, travesty, comical, sad, um, just crazy. So Would you say uh, you heroic or cowardly <laughs> or just cowardly. stupid? I mean, completely cowardly. I mean, it's just, look, it's, it just, it says that, there's something bigger than what actually went on. I mean, we know from, from the, the guy who came in to clean up the mess that it was a bigger mess than Enron, right? Less controls, worse accounting, more fraud. Okay, Enron was a pretty big mess. Um, so this is worse than that. I'll argue that, you know, after watching a lot of content from, from Sam and Caroline, they're not the masterminds no no chance of that so mm -hmm. uh, i don't think this was neglect i don't think this was uh, a mistake uh, i think this was cold calculated uh intentional destruction uh, by you know somebody much higher up in in the food chain and these two are useful idiots uh, and i use that term intentionally so um again i don't want to go too deep here because you know, people don't want to talk about the past. They want to talk about the future and, and how we're going to recover. Um, look, I've been talking about this for a while that I know, you know the first. Oh, did you lose me? No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm just listening so, intently. Sorry. Oh, no, no, I was going to say, you know, the, the first five or six years of the digital asset space were what I call the, you know, the Gandhi quote, the first they ignore you. So from 2009 to 15, like, yeah, a bunch of nerds and geeks playing with your magic internet money, you know, knock yourself out. Then they laugh at you. So, you know, 16 to, to 21, like, ah, look at those nerds and geeks playing with their magic internet money. Ha, ha, ha. Then they fight you. So, you know, from this year, and unfortunately, I think for the next few years, uh, they're going to fight. And, and not only are they going to fight, I believe the regulation coming down because of this FTX debacle is, is going to be punishing. Uh, it's going to be onerous. It's going to be intentional to thwart and to delay the inevitable. The inevitable is like the, the quote says, right? Then you win. The reality is, as Dylan was saying, if you're here in the space, you've already won, right? This is the future of money. This is the technological future of truth replacing trust. That isn't going to stop just because the trust agents, the middle people like extracting rents. Uh, look, there's $7 trillion per year at stake. So let that number sink in for a second. $7 trillion, with a T, dollars per year extracted by the banking, I used to say cabal, but I heard that that makes some people mad, so I'll call it cartel. Um, that they extract rents in the form of, of late fees and service fees and transfer fees and you know all all those fees add up to about seven trillion dollars and it's unnecessary and we're going to capture all that wealth through digital assets and crypto um but it's going to take a while it's going to take a while i you know i'm 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 personally, <laughs> I have my vested interest of getting your thoughts, Mark, because I, I think that you've always made such a sensible and grounded case for Bitcoin. Um, I, I've seen you have doubled down on your 100,000 
prediction since um, this drama has unfolded. So you as well, I'm seeing that your faith not shaped by this. Um, I'd like to know how come, because a lot of investors are scared now, you know, won't government come in, over-regulate? Could there be an outright, outright ban? They're thinking, should I be taking out all my Bitcoin and, and saving whatever I have left? Yeah, so it's a couple of things. Well, it's actually a lot of things in, in that in that very good question, right? Which is um, one, you know, the the run on the banks that is happening uh, is not the failure of of the banks, right? It, it's banks are not meant to withstand runs, and the history of banking, right? We have eight hundred plus years of of history around banking, and there have been lots and lots and lots of failures. And yet, most people listening to this have the bulk of their money in a bank. You know, some have a lot in, in crypto as well, but, but most people still have the bulk of their wealth in banks. Why? Well, because we, we trust them. Well, we trust them despite the fact that in the global financial crisis, a whole bunch of them went out of business. In the savings loan crisis, a whole bunch of them went out of business. In the Knickerbocker Trust Crisis in 1907, a whole bunch of them went out of business. In the free banking era in 1840s, a whole bunch of them went out of business. And go back for you know centuries, and now we have a better solution, right? We're replacing trust with truth, which is what what Bitcoin does. And again, you were talking with Dylan about this at the end. You know, gold didn't fail, right? Gold has been a perfect store of value but not in the last two years, right? The price of gold is basically unchanged. It's, it's up a little bit. Uh, it should have doubled over the last two and a half years. Why? Well, because they doubled the money supply. And let that sink in for a second. We've been a republic for 246 years and they doubled the supply of dollars, doubled in the two year period following the lockdowns in 2020. So it's not that gold got better. It's not that Bitcoin got better. You know, one bar of gold equals one bar of gold. One ounce, I mean, one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. But we don't price in gold or we don't price in Bitcoin, right? If we did, right, the S&P 500, which everyone's all excited is rallying today, uh, it's dead flat since 1997 priced in gold. Oh, no market. I mean, it made all-time highs. Well, yeah, because we price it in toilet paper. We price it in dollars. And so Bitcoin is up precisely 100% since 2020. But, but market went down 60%, 70% since the all-time high. Yeah, because people are greedy and people push prices away from fair value. The fair value of Bitcoin was never $69,000, even when it traded at $69,000. The value of the network at that time was closer to $30,000. Now, the value of the network has actually declined, believe it or not, for the first time, because people stopped using the asset. They hoarded, right? They rejected the, the CFI experience. And here's the thing. If, if the message that everybody wants for Bitcoin is we all need to hold our Bitcoin on a thumb drive and bury it in our backyard, we should all just go back to our old jobs because we already have that. It's called gold. We've had it for 5,000 years and gold's actually better. It can't get corrupted by an electromagnetic pulse. It can't get corrupted by water. Oh, but it's on chain and it's, yeah, but there is a chance that, you know, all the nodes could go down. Not a high chance, but you know, gold, it is what it is. You, you can't melt it. You can't, you, can't, uh, you can't evaporate it. I mean, you can melt it and change its form. But what we need is for Bitcoin to become the base layer of money. That's why I keep saying it needs to, why I believe it will be $100,000 and then $250,000 and then higher because that's the monetary value of gold, right? There's $10 trillion of gold above ground. Half of it is in jewelry, chalices, you know, gold leaf on the top of the golden dome at, at Notre Dame, right behind me. Um, and, uh, all of that doesn't really count. The monetary value is the only money that exists in the world. Only one money in the world, gold. 
right? Everything else is credit. Everything else is a currency. Currency is backed by debt. Every central bank in the world has gold. Some of them have less than they used to because as Dylan said, they moved off the gold standard and went to a fiat standard where they could devalue the currency faster because they had too much debt. But where is the gold going? It's going to China, which I believe will be the next global reserve currency. Eventually it'll be Bitcoin, but in so the future, Bitcoin wins because it is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability, which is what the definition of money is. And so it is superior to gold. Like if I had a bar of gold and I wanted to split it three ways, I couldn't bang it on the table and give you each uh, a third, too hard to do. And I couldn't stuff it in my computer and send it to you. But if I wanted to send you Bitcoin, I just punch a couple buttons and boom, I could divide you know, a Bitcoin into three pieces and send you both a third, easy. So it does have advantages in being more portable and more divisible than gold. So I think it will eventually replace gold. Five trillion monetary value of gold roughly equals $250,000 price per Bitcoin. Now, that won't happen tomorrow, but over time it's gonna happen. Yeah. And the $100,000 number comes from the value of the network over the next couple of years as we get into the next bull cycle after the next halving. Because what the halving does, it was actually a genius uh, element of the design. So the 21 million is genius. And I think it's really interesting. Um, I have this friend, Lisa Huff, and, and her daughter came up with this idea of why there's 21 million Bitcoin, right? We all know that Satoshi Nakamoto's birthday is 4575. Why is that? Well, 45 was the date in 1933 of the issue of Executive Order 6102 that Dylan talked about. Well, 1975 was when we went off that and it was legal in the United States to own gold again. So we could own money again. So that period from 1933 to 1975, it was illegal to own money in the United States. So people still did, but, but it was actually technically illegal. So that's Satoshi Nakamoto's birthday. It's not then a coincidence that Bitcoin was born in the middle of the global financial crisis where money was being assaulted by the trust agents and we bailed out the banks, right? The first message in the Bitcoin blockchain and the Genesis block is the picture of the chancellor bailing out the, uh, the banks. And so the, this uh, young woman, she's only you know teenager, she said, well, you know, 6102, 21 and six zeros is 21 million. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. It's brilliant. So it's probably where 21 million came from. But there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. We can't create more. We know how many are going to be created. But the genius was every four years, we cut the number of block rewards. And if you think about it, the miners who basically use computing power to secure the network, Bitcoin blockchain is the most secure computing network in the history of mankind. It's 1,500 times more powerful than the CERN supercomputer, which is the next most powerful computer in the world. And it has never been hacked, not once. It's been up 99.999% of the time, not one fraudulent transaction. How many times you had to get a new visa number from, because of fraud? Plenty. So mm -hmm. the Bitcoin blockchain is the future, but when those block rewards go down, the price has to go up. Why? because the miners costs are roughly fixed electricity and and machines so in order for them not to all go bankrupt simultaneously the price has to rise and as the price rises that attracts new entrants right movement is what attracts new entrants and that's why we get this four-year cycle but if you notice every year the low is higher now this year will be one of two years where that didn't happen but in most years the low is higher than the previous year and the highs are higher and the lows and that's because the network is growing so tim peterson friend of mine runs n squared crypto did a model uh the original metcalf's law model predicted hundred thousand dollars in 2022 this year and the stock to flow used that and everybody else used it and the problem was the decay factor for the metcalf's law model was too low tim increased the decay factor said there were gonna be people to drop out of the network. And so he did a new model and it says that 100,000 sometime in 2023, 2024 
around the halving, which is, is kind of January, February, or maybe it's February or March of, of 2024. So I mean, it's a long answer to your question. No, no, it's a, it's a good answer. And I hope I can get through my next two questions that you just made me think of. When you say that you see Bitcoin replacing gold, help me understand how you get, you would have to change the belief system, the belief system of the Chinese, of Indians, of central banks. I mean, is this a multi-generational uh, point of view that it would take, you know, centuries to change? Uh, how would, would it's you, a multi-decade. happen? multi-decade. No, it's a multi-decade view. Look, things of this nature happen in decades, not days or months. So world reserve currencies have a shelf life of about 70 years, seven decades, seven to eight. So you go back to the 1400s with Portugal. Portugal, seriously, Portugal? World reserve currency? Yep, why? Because they had the tallest trees, therefore they had the tallest mass, they had the fastest ships, most powerful navy. And the way you secured your world reserve currency status was by having powerful navy. So Spain takes over Portugal, they get the faster ships, then France takes over Spain, then the Netherlands takes over France, then London or the UK gets the steam engine, so no more sailing ships, now you got powered ships, then we get nuclear subs, and so now we're the world reserve currency. Well, what China figured out a decade ago is the next war it can be fought with ships, it can be fought with chips. So now it's not about naval superiority. They don't care about how many aircraft carriers. They care about superiority in AI, 5G, and computing power. 96% of AI citations this year come out of China. So they, I believe, will be the next world reserve currency. Well, then where does Bitcoin fit in? Well, Bitcoin then becomes ultimately, as you say, a belief system, right? All currencies are currencies because of belief. There's nothing that backs any currency, right? If you hand a green piece of paper to the government, $20 bill, they don't give you $20 of gold. They don't give you $20 of silver. They don't give you $20 of future tax receipts. There's nothing, right? And they don't even use green pieces of paper in Israel. They use yellow pieces of paper. And in China, they use red pieces of paper. It is simply belief and custom. That's what makes a currency a currency. So the custom has been that central banks, right? Central banks didn't exist before 1600, 1607, when the Rothschilds created the first central bank. And the Netherlands was the world reserve currency at that point. And then part of the Rothschild clan moved to London, opened up the Bank of England. England became the superpower. Uh, and then we, using the same model, started uh, the Fed in 1913. It took us 31 years to become the world reserve currency, 1944, after the war. So Bretton Woods. So what happened? Well, the UK was the world reserve currency. What did they do? They incurred a bunch of debt by invading Mesopotamia, fighting a war that they shouldn't have fought. And they got into debt, world, the pound sterling collapsed. We ascended, we became the superpower, the dollar ascended. China then essentially, we then invaded coincidentally Mesopotamia, wars we couldn't finance. So our debt level went up. So now the only way out is to print money. And so the Fed said today, the reason stocks are rallying today, is, oh, we're going to slow interest rates. Well, of course you are. And then eventually next year, you're going to cut interest rates and you're going to print more money because the only way out for an empire that's overly indebted, okay, even if they tried to tax all the wealth in the United States, couldn't pay back the debt. Okay, So then you could restructure the debt, but in order to restructure it, someone would have to take 70 cents on the dollar, 60 cents on the dollar. Chinese aren't taking it. Russians aren't taking it. You know, Belgians aren't taking it. You can default on it. The Argentinians do all the time. But if you default, what happens? You get kicked out of power. So you don't default openly. You default as Dylan described. You devalue the currency. So that is exactly what's happening right in front of our eyes. Now, everyone talks about the strong dollar. It's not strong. DXY is not the dollar. DXY is the relative value of the dollar versus the yen and the euro, okay? The dollar is toilet paper and, or crepe paper, and the yen is super toilet paper, and the euro is just toilet paper. I mean, the yen has been absolutely massacred, down 40% this year. So we look good by comparison, but 
versus the renminbi, we're dead flat over the last two years. So the renminbi is ascendant. And so to answer your question, Danielle, what's going to happen is central banks used to have just gold. Then they had gold and dollars and then yen and euros. Now they have some renminbi. Eventually, they're going to have some Bitcoin. Who's going to be first? I don't know. Estonia, maybe you know China, maybe Russia. But eventually, they're going to have some Bitcoin. And then eventually, Bitcoin will edge out gold. But it won't happen in months or weeks. It'll happen in decades, plural. Because remember how an S-curve works. An S-curve of adoption takes 30 years. First 10%, 10 years. Second, 80% next 10 years and the last 10%, you know, the late stage over the last decade. So we're, I call it 10 years in, you know, the first four years we're total science project really doesn't count. Uh, so we're about 10 years in to the S curve. We're at about 11%, which is about where we should be. The next 10 years we'll get 80% adoption. Pretty amazing when you think about it. And then the last 10 years uh, we'll get the last stragglers. But, you know, I think it's a, 10 or 20 year process of having central banks around the world realize that in order for them to have a viable central bank asset, they'll have to have gold and Bitcoin mm. and a few other you know, major currencies in, the, in their basket. Interesting, interesting uh, thoughts, Mark. I have so many other questions for you. So you know what? I'm going to invite you right now onto my show for more in-depth <laughs> talk. Uh, for my all right, let's do it. Um, uh, thank you. Yeah, um, so many other questions for you. Really great. I always uh, love talking with you. Thank you, Mark. No, thanks, y'all. Have a great rest of your Let's conference, and uh, appreciate you doing this. Appreciate you uh, focusing on education and and giving uh, absolutely like myself uh, and Dylan and others a chance to uh, to chat. Absolutely, absolutely. Education is key, especially in times like this. So we're going to take another quick break and we will be back uh, with our uh, last few speakers. Don't go anywhere.